Okay, so um, we want to welcome everyone to the first grand rounds, public health grand rounds of the semester. And um, as you know, just a, a, a brief reminder, uh, we will have at this time for most of the weeks of the coming semester, uh, noon time, uh, esteemed guests from a very diverse set of knowledge, experience, and backgrounds, which is the goal uh, of this uh, semi this um, seminar and Grand Round series is to provide um, our students, our staff, our faculty, and our community partners with information about uh, diverse areas in which health, uh, both uh, mental, physical, behavioral, and spiritual crosses paths. Please come to the information desk to claim it. My apologies, I'm in the airport, so I will be brief uh, into introducing our uh, introducing our guests. So, without further ado, uh, let me introduce our guests today. Um, we uh, like to our guest uh, title is an overview of commercial sexual exploitation of children um, as a public health crisis. And we appreciate um, the two guests we have, Ms. Kathleen Cleveland Kennedy, um, who is from the state is a statewide care coordinator for the CSEC response team of the Children Advocacy Center of Georgia. And uh, her colleague uh, is Ms. Natasha McDowell, who is director of that response team um, and advocacy center in Georgia. So without further ado, I will turn the um, podium over to our guests. I'll let them add any additional uh, introductions or information about themselves and, we'll, and I'll sign off. Oh, one more thing. I may have to leave a little early. So my colleague, Ms. Okaramati will close out the session. Okay, without further ado, I am turning it over to our guests. Um, either one of y'all can go first. Uh, as you all have uh, practice, I'm guessing. Awesome, thank you so much. And um, thank you for having us this afternoon. So um, as uh, he stated, my name is Kathleen Cleveland Kennedy. I am the statewide care coordinator with CACGA, the CSEC response team. And I'm joined today um, by our, with our director, Nasha McDowell, who is our director for the CSEC response team. Uh, Nasha is actually joining us. She uh, has a background in public health herself. And so today we're excited to give you an overview um, of what commercial sexual exploitation is, talk a little bit about the vulnerabilities that are present that place youth at risk for CSEC victimization, and also look at this issue through a public health lens. I think a lot of times when people talk about commercial sexual exploitation, um, we know that you know, there's a crime committed and that youth are being exploited and that it's definitely a safety and well-being and child abuse issue but it's also a significant public health issue as well. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about that. And so um, to get us started off today, um, we are going to just go over some objectives. And then from there, we're going to give a background about, give some definitions um, about what CSEC is. So you have a basic understanding of what CSEC and human trafficking is. From there, we're gonna talk about some warning signs and vulnerabilities that place youth at risk, as well as understand some of the trauma and abuse and victimization that's associated with CSEC or commercial sexual exploitation of children. We'll finish out by talking a little bit about what our response looks like and some of the um, different resources that are available to um, the community and, and victims that have been, um, that have experienced commercial sexual exploitation. So let's talk a little bit about what human trafficking is and what CSEC is. Um, let's see. So for some reason, this uh, the formatting on this went um, a little different. And so this was a myth and fact. They were supposed to show up one sticky note at a time. Um, but these are just some myths and facts. So I am going to briefly go over this, um, go over some of these statements that we sometimes hear, but um, you know, some of these are misperceptions that are in this the work that we we do every single day. So the first one is um, traffickers are always male. Um, and so I wanted to see, and it looks like the answers have not shown up. So I wanted to see if I'm gonna pull up the chat, if you guys will put um, in the chat, whether you guys think this is a myth or a fact. I see a few myths. 
Yeah, absolutely. So it looks like everybody put myth. That's absolutely true. Uh, we see that women um, are, can act absolutely be traffickers. Um, and so traffickers can be from any type of background, any any gender, any socioeconomic status, um, but traffickers are not always male. And we're actually gonna talk about um, different techniques that traffickers use in order to try to recruit and how um, the recruiting mechanism into CSEC is sometimes a little different than people realize. So the next one is children in the commercial sex industry are bad kids. Do you guys think that's a myth or a fact? Nick, absolutely. Um, and so, yeah, a lot of times we, youth that have experienced sexual exploitation, um, one of the things that we often see is that these youth get defined by their behaviors. Um, when in reality, they maybe get defined as a runaway or they may get defined as being truant or being defiant or being aggressive. Um, but one of the things that we know is that a lot of times are, well, in almost every case where a youth has been trafficked, they have experienced significant abuse, um, significant neglect, and even prior to their exploitation, they also had a history of abuse and neglect. And we're going to touch on that a little bit later. And so um, something that as a CSEC response team that we always remain focused on is reminding individuals that these are kids and that there is oftentimes elements of force, fraud, or coercion present. And that it's important that when we're working with these kids that we're not defining them um, as bad kids or defining them as these behaviors. Because what we know is that these behaviors are often trauma responses or they're responses that they've learned to develop um, in order to survive. So absolutely, thank you. Um, and before I move on to the next one, I do wanna add that if you look in the chat, there was a handout that was shared. Um, it was a PDF, it was shared by Nation McDowell. And so if you want to pull up that handout as I'm going through this presentation, feel free to follow along. Um, some of the same information that we will be talking about today will also be contained in that handout. So the next one, um, to pick another one, is you choose to enter the sex trade. Do you guys think that's a myth or a fact? I see some myths. Yeah, absolutely. Um, many of the youth that we, that we encounter are um, lured into CSEC victimization by individuals, often because there is a need that's not being met. Um, and there is a there's a famous quote um, by your survivor that said um, th that talked about how, you know, when you're talking about you choosing to enter the sex trade, there must be some other viable alternative instead of that. And for many of these youth, even for youth that are engaging in survival sex to meet their own needs, they're doing so out of necessity and they're doing so because there's often needs that are not getting met um, and they're being lured by traffickers and other individuals that are uh, you know, coercing them or giving them promises of something that um, they don't currently have or giving them promises of, you know, something else that they're seeking to obtain. Um, we'll do one more. And that one is kids solicit sex because of a substance abuse disorder. Um, do you guys think that's a myth or a fact? I see one myth. Anyone else have any thoughts on that? So this, I see another myth. So this one is interesting. And so um, oftentimes a substance abuse disorder can be a, a vulnerability that places you at increased risk. And so there are instances that time the youth may engage in sexual acts in order to obtain substances. And so while um, so I would say that this one kind of falls in the middle of it's not necessarily completely true and it's not necessarily a myth. And so this one was kind of a trick one. Um, but there are situations where if youth have a, a, you know, a substance abuse disorder that places them at increased risk for uh, CSEC victimization because there may be individuals that approach them that are um, that recognize this vulnerability and are putting them in situations where in order to obtain these substances they may be addicted to, they have to engage in sexual acts. So thanks so much for, for participating with that. 
So now let's move on and talk about some definitions about what CSEC and human trafficking is. And so from looking over here at this chart on the left, commercial sexual exploitation falls under a larger umbrella of human trafficking. I mean, human trafficking can, can be defined as a crime that involves exploiting a person either for labor services or for commercial sex. And so then that brings you down um, to the two primary subsections of human trafficking, which is labor trafficking and sex trafficking. With labor trafficking, that involves the recruitment, harboring, transportation, provision, or obtaining of a person for labor um, or services by force, fraud, or coercion. So some possible sectors that you may see this happen in, you could see this happen in the agricultural or construction industry. Um, you could also see it happen in the adult entertainment industry or even the nannying industry. And so in these situations, these individuals by force, fraud, or coercion are being lured into performing labor or services, um, but they're being trafficked and they're being exploited for those services. And they're often either put in unsafe living conditions, not being paid or being threatened um, with harm or deportation, um, things along those lines. Um, so with sex trafficking, it is similar, except instead of labor uh, services being exchanged, it is um, sexual acts. And so sex trafficking is defined when a commercial sex act is induced by force, fraud, or coercion, or when the person performing the act is under the age of 18. So in these situations, individuals um, are being forced to perform um, sexual acts and there is an individual that's using force, fraud, or coercion in order for them to do it. And so let's then move on to talking about commercial, C um, commercial sexual exploitation of children, um, which is a subsection of CSEC. I'm sorry, of sex trafficking. Um, so commercial sexual exploitation is defined as a sexual activity involving a child in exchange for something of value or promise thereof to the child or another person. So in this situation, the child's being treated as a commercial sexual object. And so I want to go back for a second and differentiate the definitions between sex trafficking and CSEC. So with sex tra trafficking, when we're talking about when law enforcement is pursuing sex trafficking charges with adults, that element of force, fraud, or coercion has to be present. However, when you're dealing with children, any time that a sexual act is exchanged for an item of value, that's considered CSEC. And so um, CSEC is a type of sex trafficking but again, when it's dealing with children, that element of force, fraud, or coercion does not have to be proven in a court of law in order for that youth to have experienced CSEC victimization. So next, let's move on and talk about where and how trafficking is occurring. I think one of the most common things that you know we hear when we talk to the community about sex trafficking or commercial sexual exploitation, something that comes to mind is often that video taken. Um, and that video often represents what most people think of when they think of CSEC for sex trafficking, and that's trafficker facilitated CSEC. And so with trafficker facilitated CSEC, that is where um, you have an individual, a group of individuals that is using elements of force, fraud, or coercion to force individuals to engage in sexual acts for items of value, most commonly money. Um, and the reason that you see a picture of a classroom here is because one of the techniques that is increasingly being used by traffickers and gangs as well when it comes to sexually exploiting youth is that they are having other youth serve as recruiters for new youth. And the reason for that is because we know that from a young age, youth are often taught about stranger danger and not talking to people they don't know. And so one of the things that has really evolved um, you know, over the last couple of decades, several years, is that traffickers are having other youth that are already involved in CSEC and using them to recruit other youth in classrooms or youth in their communities, um, telling them, you know, act, telling them to convince them that, hey, um, I get all this new stuff or you, there's this way you can make money or you can go out to this, you know, to these cool places and hang out with these cool people. And so that's why you see um, a classroom is because more and more we're seeing the traffickers are utilizing youth as a means for recruitment um, to bring in new youth or new individuals. And so then you also see a picture of a computer. Um, and this is indicative of technology facilitated CSEC. And so we know that the internet, you know, smartphones, laptops, computers, that it makes our life much easier, right? We have access to information at the drop of a hat. 
But we also know that there is a dark side to the internet and to social media and to the web in general. And so with technology facilitated CSEC, that is where um, explicit images or videos are being exchanged online for items of value. And so in this instance, you could have a youth that's exchanging explicit images with an individual and getting items of value in return, or an, another individual that is taking these images they've obtained and exchanging them for items of value online. The other note I wanna add about technology facilitated CSEC is that um, in many types of trafficking, when individuals are trying to set up what they often call dates or plays, situations for that individual to exchange those sexual acts for money, technology is often used. Um, it could be through social media, it could be through different websites. Uh, there were, there used to be websites called like Backpage and Craigslist, and some of those have been shut down, but there've been new websites that have emerged. And so when we start talking about human trafficking and CSEC, um, technology is often a, uh, a tool that's used by different traffickers in order to um, generate revenue. Next, you see a picture of a house, and that's just indicative um, to say that there's also another subsection called family facilitated CSEC. And with family facilitated CSEC, that's where um, there is a youth and one of their relatives is either exchanging sexual acts with that child for items of value or a situation where that relative is um, having that youth engage in sexual acts for others for items of value. A couple of very quick notes that I will say on this is that with family facilitated CSEC victims, these victims are often younger. So most of the youth that we work with are between the ages of 13 and 17. Um, many of the youth that are victims of family facilitated CSEC um, can fall between six and 13 years old. Um, and also most commonly with family facilitated CSEC, about two thirds of the time, research tells us that it is, it is the mother that is the primary trafficker in family facilitated CSEC cases. You see the massage parlor and that's just indicative of business facilitated CSEC. So in those situations, that's where you have a youth that may be participating at a strip club or massage parlor and they are performing sexual acts at that business and that business is profiting off of that exploitation or they're turning a blind eye to it. We touched briefly on gang facilitated CSEC. The only thing that I wanna quickly highlight about gang facilitated CSEC is that over the last 10 to 20 years, um, gangs have increasingly turned to human trafficking and sex trafficking as a means to generate revenue as opposed to um, drug trafficking or arms dealing. And part of the reason for that, unfortunately, is that they perceive it as less risky. But in addition, when you make a sale of a firearm or a drug, you can only make that sale one time and then that's it. Unfortunately, when you're dealing with human beings in a sex trafficking scenario, that individual can be sold multiple times um, a day, multiple times a week and throughout you know, the entire month or for several years. And then finally, you see the picture um, of a youth that's holding up a homeless sign and that's indicative of survival sex. And so with survival sex, that's where you have a youth that um, is not able to meet their own basic needs. Um, it could be a situation where the child left home or the child was kicked out of their home and they are forced to engage in sexual acts in order to um, be able to find shelter, have um, clothing and food, et cetera. And so moving on to talk about the impact, I'm now gonna turn it over to Nation McDowell. Thank you, Kathleen. So briefly, we're going to go through just how this issue impacts the populations that we serve, which are children up to 17 years of age. And so we'll talk about who is impacted and how they're impacted. And the first slide that we wanted to sort of start with is, is the sexual abuse or the continuum of sexual abuse and CSEC. And so oftentimes it's, it's easy to assume that children sort of just fall into the life of exploitation or uh, sex work for those who are adults, but there's often sort of a continuum that leads them down this path or makes them more susceptible uh, to exploitation. So patterns created as a result of unresolved childhood sexual abuse, for example, such as failure of trust, keeping secrets, viewing oneself as a sexual object, blurred boundaries, linking sex with love, even feeling helpless and angry, acting out can all lead to CSEC vulnerabilities. And CSEC is a significant risk factor for, um, or I'm sorry, sexual abuse is a significant risk factor for CSEC in that 70 to 90% of sexually exploited children have a history of childhood sexual abuse. 
And so when we think of sort of this public health crisis of human trafficking, particularly child sex trafficking or the commercial sexual exploitation of children, we cannot talk about this issue without also talking about childhood sexual abuse. Childhood sexual abuse is easily one of the number one sort of risk factors for commercial sexual exploitation. Of course, not saying that it will happen, but just saying that it puts children at increased vulnerability. And those statistics, the statistic I just shared is national. However, it rings true for our, our children here in Georgia as well. That data is consistent with the children that we serve here across the state of Georgia. Next slide. All right, so we all are, are familiar for the most part with Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? And so when we think about sort of a public health approach to addressing commercial sexual exploitation, we have to think about on a basic level, why are children and even adults falling victim to this issue? And so we have to think about Maslow's hierarchy of needs and the basic elements and needs that we all have as human beings, those being self-actualization, esteem, love and belonging, safety, freedom from fear, and psychological needs being met. And so one of the things that we point out is that many sex traffickers will lure their victims by providing basic survival needs. So those three prongs, those three bottom prongs here that are most important in, in this sort of Maslow's hierarchy of needs are being addressed by exploiters. And they may sort of systemically provide distorted versions of higher needs to manipulate the victims. So they may use threats, force, and coercion. Traffickers may exploit the fact that for many victims, the life, which refers to, uh, unfortunately, the victimization of exploitation may be their first experience of family and belonging. And so we have many youth that will tell us, hey, I was being you know, abused or raped at home. And my trafficker told me I might as well get paid for it. So I left home without permission or ran away, joined this person who for the first time told me they loved me, provided me with all the basic resources that I needed and gave me sort of a family that I never had at home. And we know that's not always the case for all of the victims that we work with, but for a significant portion of the children that we serve, there was often a, a portion of this sort of hierarchy of needs that was missing from their life that the trafficker then provided and unfortunately exploited. And so we have a quote here uh, from one trafficker who said that my job was to make sure she has what she needs, or my job is to make sure she has what she needs, personal hygiene, get her nails done, take her to buy an outfit, take her out to eat, make her feel wanted, but I keep the money. So again, there's sort of this distorted uh, relationship where this person is coming in, exploiting this child, basically selling their body for sex and sexual acts, maybe dishing out a few dollars here and there to make sure some of their basic needs are met, maybe providing them with the love and the attention that they crave. But at the end of the day, keeping the, the money that this child or this person is making as a result of those sex acts or exploiting this child for those sex acts. So again, creating sort of this distorted version of higher needs to manipulate that victim. And so we, we like to share this because it's so easy to ask ourselves, well, how did the child fall into this issue of exploitation? Why didn't they ask for help? And oftentimes Maslow's hierarchy of needs helps us to explain that even further. This next slide here is just a video um, of a young lady who is a survivor of child sex trafficking. Her name is Jatia Raymond. She's a survivor out of California. This video is actually a couple of years old, but basically it demonstrates that continuum that we just took a look at, the continuum of patterns created by unaddressed childhood sexual abuse and other forms of trauma that lead to commercial sexual exploitation. So let's listen to Jatia's story and then we'll, we'll engage a little bit afterwards. I'm trying to tell you what I see in myself when I look in the And Kathleen, I don't think we can see the video. I have to slide it over. Here we go. Thank you. The mirror. But all I see is a silhouette because the figure not clear. I'm trying to tell you what I see in myself when I look in the mirror. But all I see is a silhouette because the figure not clear. But I'm confused. I don't know what to say. I don't know who to be. I don't know what to do. All I know is what it feels like to be half dead and abused. 
If you don't love nobody, then nobody could hurt you. That's why I'm always stuck in places like this, where they always gotta search you. But I wanna love somebody. I want a mama that'll say this is your curfew. And a daddy that's protective enough not to let anybody hurt you. To me, it's a fantasy, but you say I'll meet the perfect family one day. I say okay to make it seem like your words are forever in my head, but it's not. To me, those words are dead and hot. Need some water to cool this fire in my chest. So many times, suicide almost became the answer, but instead, my daddy was put to rest. They say it's not my fault, but to this day, I still think it is. He'll be here in my arms and I'll be in his. No tears, no harm, and I'll still be a kid. Mama walked out on me when I was two because drugs was a new daughter. Something deep inside told me she fought and there was no way she could have fought harder. I heard stories about me crawling in Mama's ID, finding white powder, stumbling to the table, drinking Budweiser, and playing with that green leaf I thought was a flower. 13 or 14 years later, I'm locked up and it's the best thing that's ever happened to me. I might have been through the struggle, but I'm a survivor as well. So when you ask me who I see in the mirror looking back at me, I'm going to say a girl who survived hell. Thank you, Kathleen. So Jatia's story is just one of, of countless stories that our survivors have, um, including various forms of childhood trauma, poly victimization, uh, just experiencing some of the, the worst circumstances of life. And then unfortunately being uh, sort of coerced or, or caught up in the throes of childhood uh, sexual exploitation. So the next slide that we're going to take a look at here highlights some of the vulnerabilities that many of the youth that we work with that are CSEC victims have. And so when I talk about vulnerabilities, I, I want to share that a vulnerability is not a weakness. Um, it is something about a person that another person may choose to exploit. And Kathleen, I believe it, it isn't popping up just yet, but it may have to stop and pull it back up. So I wanted to share that first, because when we talk to kids throughout the state, um, when, when you say vulnerability, the first thing they're saying is, I'm not weak. I'm, I'm not weak. I know what I'm doing. So we have to help them understand that simply you being under the age of 18 can be a vulnerability. Someone may choose to exploit the fact that you are under the age of 18. So we like to talk about that. And Kathleen, if I need to share on my end, I'm happy to do so. It's just not pulling up. I know Zoom can be fun on that end. Okay. Is it sharing now? Uh, it's pulling up and then there you go. If you wanna share from her slide, perfect. All right, so you see the vulnerabilities listed here. If you could in the chat list some of the vulnerabilities that Jatia mentioned in her poem, sort of about her experience um, as a survivor and her early childhood experiences as well. So if you could in the chat, just list some of the vulnerabilities that you heard during Jatia's poem. Loneliness, abandonment from her mother, Absolutely. A family history of substance use. Absolutely. And Jatia had direct access to these substances, unfortunately, and um, uh, certainly suffered as a result of having access to those substances. Guilt over her father's death. Thank you. So these are all vulnerabilities that unfortunately can lead to exploitation for some of the kids that we work with. And so we, we like to highlight these things because the stage of adolescence, as I said before, is a vulnerability, creates vulnerabilities for our young people. But these vulnerabilities in particular that are listed here on the slide put youth at significant risk. Uh, these are vulnerabilities that statistically speaking and are research-based that show that our youth are especially vulnerable for CSEC if these vulnerabilities are present in their life. And so we like to share those. And of course, thank you, Joy, a member of a marginalized community. Um, just last year, or I'm sorry, in 2021, 50, over 50% 50 of the kids that we serve were African-American. And so there is certainly overrepresentation of black and brown youth as victims of commercial sexual exploitation, not only here in Georgia, but across the United States. The next slide we wanted to share is again, when we talk about sort of a, a public health approach to CSEC or a public health understanding of it, having sort of a social ecological perspective is important. As mentioned, all children have vulnerabilities. Some are temporary, some are about personal feelings or struggles, and some are even a part of our communities and environments. So this image here illustrates how the risk factors build from that of an individual level 
to the larger community. A child who witnesses domestic violence at home sees the impact that violence has on the family and the ripple effects on their community. And so when we look at CSEC, just a child's age, as we said, being under 18, particularly being between the ages of about 12 to 14, puts a youth at significant risk. Uh, if that youth is homeless, experiences homelessness, or leaves home without care, that can, of course, be a risk factor. But then when we go to the interpersonal level, dysfunctional family dynamics, child maltreatment, those are additional interpersonal factors that can put a kid at, at risk. Community level factors include poverty, the experience of poverty, uh, social values and norms. So maybe this, this community is prone to violence and other forms of trauma. And then on the societal level, how is capitalism playing into this issue? When we look at the sexualization of children um, in TV and media and in, in music, how is that also contributing to the issue of CSEG? So we like to share this because it's easy to blame victims. It's easy to parent blame. But at the end of the day, we all have a role and how this issue is being exacerbated and how we can also come to the table and make sure that it's addressed properly. We like to share this statistic here because oftentimes we'll get questions, what is the average age? And the average age of entry into commercial sexual exploitation is 12 to 14. That is oftentimes the age at which we identify youth. However, statistics and research shows that youth are often exploited up to two years earlier than we actually identify them. So we actually need to be looking at kids as young as nine and 10 years old when we talk about prevention education, when we talk about intervention methods, uh, we need to go a little bit more upstream and make sure that children are being educated properly and in an age appropriate manner earlier and earlier. The human trafficking power and control will is sort of the answer to the question why didn't the child just leave? Why didn't the person just leave? And please understand that asking such questions is harmful to victims. And let's sort of explain why. Each spoke here that you see on the human trafficking power and control wheel is a method that a trafficker uses to maintain undue influence over a victim. So imagine being a developing young person. So we're talking about someone between the ages of 10 and 14 who's dealing with maybe their own trauma at home on a, a daily basis who is now experiencing economic abuse, intimidation, emotional and sexual abuse on a daily basis. Most adults would have a difficult time uh, sort of escaping a situation like that, much less a young person. So let's talk about what Georgia is doing. I, I know this is heavy information and it's easy to think that what can I do as a public health professional, as a student of this work, um, but just know that you are in a state that is taking strides to address this issue on a, on a daily basis. So one of the, the things that we pride ourselves on as a response team is that we use a multidisciplinary approach to commercial sexual exploitation of children. What does that mean? That means that every person who needs to be at the table in terms of the child's treatment and recovery plan is at that table. That includes law enforcement, forensic interviewers. These are the people that are speaking to the children about these experiences that they've had with commercial sexual exploitation, our child welfare professionals, advocates, mental health professionals, district attorney's offices, all of those folks are at the table as we're coordinating treatment plans for the kids that we're serving. And that means that no person is sort of being left out, no entities such as our medical professionals are being left out of the equation. Um, no person from law enforcement who is often involved in the recovery is being left out of the equation as well. Our response also prioritizes medical services and so CSEC victims are at increased risk of developing STIs, HIV, um, unplanned pregnancies, all types of different challenges and issues. And so we prioritize youth having access to trauma-informed medical services. So that may include a sexual assault nurse examiner. That may include STI testing, drug screenings, pregnancy tests. And these Medical exams in Georgia are handled per the child abuse protocols that are present within each county. But it's so important that we, pu we publicize that the risk factors for STIs, I mean, we can easily say that a little over 50% of the children that we serve that have been confirmed as victims have had some form of an STI at some point um, in their life. And that is staggering when you think about sort of the public health implications of this. And these children, unfortunately, are in communities. They are being exploited. They're also having maybe consensual sex with other kids their age. 
And so this is putting the entire community at risk. So it's important that kids that are trafficking victims receive comprehensive medical services. In terms of mandated reporting, if you find yourself coming across a situation where you suspect that a child is a victim of commercial sexual exploitation, there are three things that we would ask you to do. Um, one being, of course, as, as someone in an emergency situation, if there's impending danger or you see that the child is actively maybe being trafficked or you're um, afraid for their safety, we say call law enforcement immediately, call 911. Do not get yourself involved. Do not try to intercede on behalf of that victim because that could put you and other community members at risk. So if, if it's an impending danger situation or it's happening currently, please call 911. However, if it's a situation where you have suspicions or concerns, we encourage you to of course make a report to DFACS, but you can also call our team at 1-866-NHTGA. That's 1-866-363-4842. We're option two on the hotline and make a referral. We work closely with our child welfare partners and with law enforcement. So when you make a report to DFACS, that information comes to our team and vice versa. We also make reports to DFACS as well on behalf of community members that maybe didn't make a report. But we encourage you to have all of the contact information of these various agencies. So that way you, you have multiple options in the event that you need to make a referral or a report. In terms of statewide data, we like to sort of give you a snapshot of just how many youth that are at risk of trafficking in the state of Georgia. So in 2022, we received 213 hotline calls, 574 web referrals. So we have a HIPAA compliant web referral form on our website where folks can make referrals and most of our partners will go through the website. And we served 813 youth in the state of Georgia. Now, not all 813 youth were confirmed as CSEC victims, but all 813 youth had some form of risk factors for commercial sexual exploitation. And we're talking every part of the state, as far north as um, Fannin County, as far south as Lowndes County. Uh, so we have to just understand that this issue is not a Metro Atlanta issue. It's not a city issue. It's a state of Georgia issue. And you do have professionals doing what we can to address it throughout the state. I'm gonna to toss it back over to Kathleen to finish up with some prevention. Thanks, Nisha. So with the prevention, we're gonna talk about um, how do we prevent this issue? Um, one of the things that we know is we were we become, we became the statewide um, enhanced collaborative model response for responding to commercial sexual exploitation in 2020. And since that time, year over year, we have seen an increase in the number of children that are being exploited and that are being trafficked. The other thing that we know is Nisha talked about how we served 813 youth last year, but something else that we know about this problem is that it's still a problem that we can't fully see. We know that it was significantly more than 813 youth that experienced commercial sexual exploitation um, and that the nature of this problem can sometimes be hard to identify and hard to find due to the force, fraud, and coercion that's involved with it, the secrecy that these youth are, are asked to keep, um, and the fact that there's often um, organized criminal networks that are involved in this that have a vested interest in preventing these individuals from being identified. And so when we talk about, before we talk about some of the um, you know, moving more upstream in terms of prevention, I want to highlight some red flags that um, could indicate uh, that a youth could be um, at risk or could be possibly being exploited. And just like as when we were looking at the vulnerabilities, when you look at these red flags, I really want you to look at this almost as a continuum, meaning that if a youth has one vulnerability or one red flag, that doesn't necessarily indicate that a youth is being commercially sexually exploited. But the more vulnerabilities a youth possesses, the more red flags we identify, the higher likelihood, the more concerns that are present that that youth could be possibly being commercially sexually exploited. So chronic runaway youth. Um, I think this one's pretty straightforward because we know if a youth is running away that they likely don't have um, consistent means to be able to meet their basic needs. So that opens uh, doors for adults and traffickers to approach them um, with that promise, as, as Nisha talked about, that Maslow hierarchy of need for them to come in, promise those basic needs, um, but then force them into exploitation. Distinctive tattoos, especially ones that youth are not willing to disclose how they got them or the meaning of them, certainly can be a concern. 
signs of physical abuse. Um, previously, we went over the human trafficking power and control wheel. And so in addition to the sexual abuse that these youth um, sustain on a daily basis as part of being trafficked, um, they oftentimes are physically abused, not only by traffickers, but, but by, by buyers as well. Youth that are disclosing that they have informal job agreements or stating that they have debts to an employer or recruiter is absolutely a red flag. Risky sexual behavior. So if a youth is disclosing that they have um, relationships with several adult men or adult ind women individuals, um, that combined with some of these other risk factors could certainly be a concern. If a youth has sudden new goods or services, if the youth is coming in with expensive nails or hair, they're coming in with new handbags or new clothes that are unexplained, and we know that they were not provided by their family of origin, that certainly could be a concern. And then isolation from peers and sudden changes in the behavior. That one, again, can be difficult because I think part of the teenage experience, youth sometimes have sudden behavior changes, and some of that's just part of the teenage experience. Um, and sometimes we know that youth may change friend groups or change peers, but if you start seeing those and they become, they, they escalate and it's, it's out of the norm, and especially if it's accompanied with any other vulnerabilities or red flags, um, that's certainly a, an indicator and that may indicate that there is need for assessment and possibly intervention. So now let's start talking about different approaches to how we address this issue. Before I go into this though, I do wanna share a video um, that kind of talks about what it means to address an issue upstream versus downstream. So I'm gonna stop sharing and share a new screen so that we can share this video. Trusty hammer. There was once a carpenter that lived by a river in the village near you. Every day, with his trusty hammer, he built boats out of wood. One day, as the carpenter was working, he looked out onto the river and saw a child trying to swim towards the shore. Help, said the child, the current is too strong. So the carpenter grabbed a boat and rescued the child. How did you get into the river? asked the carpenter. I fell in upstream, said the child. The next day, when the carpenter looked out onto the river, he saw two children struggling to swim towards the shore. Help, the children said. The carpenter called out to another villager, and together they rescued the children. But the next day, there were five children, and the next day there were a dozen, and soon the whole village was busy rescuing children from the river. The villagers grew weary, <sighs> and some of the boats started to leak and break from overuse. The carpenter worked tirelessly to repair them, but as the number of children in the river grew, soon there weren't even enough boats to get the job done. One day, the carpenter asked himself a question. Hmm. Why and how are so many children falling into the river in the first place? So he bravely ran upstream to find out. There, he saw a big windy village with many houses, and some of the houses were in a state of disrepair. And when the wind blew especially hard, the houses creaked and cracked, and things were swept out of them and into the nearby river. Sometimes what was swept up was children. The carpenter saw an old lady walking by. Excuse me, he said to the old lady, mm -hmm. tell me, why are these houses so broken down? Why aren't these houses stronger? The people of this village want to fix these houses so that they can resist the wind, the old lady replied but we do not have the tools to do so, and the wind lately has been especially strong. I can help, said the carpenter, uh -huh. and with the help of the old lady, he gathered the villagers, gave them his hammer, and taught them how to use it, so that they could learn to make their houses strong when the wind blew especially hard, and keep their children from falling into the river. Yay! Because you see, if we make the effort to go upstream, and help build strong foundations there, we won't need to work so hard to rescue children downstream. And so that just highlights um, that when we're talking about this issue of commercial sexual exploitation in transparency, when we're looking at it from a state issue and even a nationwide issue, many of the efforts that are being made by states and by our nation 
are what we'd classify as downstream efforts. And, and part of that is because this is a relatively um, new, um, not new concern that it hasn't happened before, but it's really emerged as a much bigger crisis than we initially thought. And so we're currently in the stage nationwide where one of the main goals we have is spreading education in order for people to be able to recognize the warning signs. And so with that, we are working on making sure that we're doing a better job of identifying. One of the things that we have learned through um, new research that's come out is that we are, there's still concerns that we're missing different types of trafficking. I think especially when you're starting talking about family facilitated CSEC, there's still room to grow in terms of education. And so um, downstream efforts are efforts that we're doing now that we absolutely have to continue to do, um, but it's not necessarily going to make an impact on preventing the root causes of what's leading to commercial sexual exploitation. So some downstream efforts that are being developed not only here in Georgia and in your home communities, but throughout the nation are um, increasing sexual health education beginning at middle school, making sure that they understand, um, you know, the risk for STIs, pregnancy, et cetera. Caregiver education on CSEC for youth over 10 years old. Um, there's several initiatives that are getting started here in Georgia that's working on educating caregivers about what CSEC is and recognizing those warning signs. We're also seeing a lot more programs that are being developed for at-risk youth and different CSEC intervention programs, which includes residential facilities dedicated to rehabilitating survivors. And so all of these things are things that we must continue to work on and continue to develop, but it's important to note that these are um, reactive uh, interventions for something that has already occurred or something that is continuing to occur. And so if we really want to get to the root cause and start preventing CSEC from happening, we have to start thinking upstream. We have to start identifying what are some of the root causes that are placing youth at risk. And those upstream initiatives really are going to focus on those vulnerabilities that we highlighted earlier in this presentation. So ensuring that um, sexual abuse and exploitation that are age-appropriate education are being provided to youth. Nasha talked about that the average age of entry into commercial sexual exploitation is 12 to 14, but that youth, um, that it can take some time for us to be able to identify these youth, up to one to two years. So um, finding age appropriate education to give to youth that are nine, 10 and 11 years old. Teaching meaningful consent and what that looks like. Um, providing caregiver education on childhood sexual abuse prevention and intervention. Nasha touched on this earlier, but if, if you were to ask us, where is the one area that we could focus on to try to help prevent commercial sexual exploitation? It starts with childhood sexual abuse. And that's because out of all the risk factors that we see for youth that have been commercially sexually exploited, childhood sexual abuse has the most correlation in terms of being a risk factor. And so um, a huge step that we can take in terms of prevention for commercial sexual exploitation is providing education on child sexual abuse, ensuring that youth have a safe person they can go to if they've experienced sexual abuse and ensuring that those um, services, counseling services, support services for that child and that family after childhood sexual abuse has occurred, making sure that that's in place comprehensive sexual health education and access to quality health care are crucial. Um, we talked about how STIs and unwanted pregnancy are, are absolutely significant concerns for these youth. And sometimes some of the, you know, different STIs, especially things like HIV or if it's developed into AIDS, um, it's something that can't, you know, it can be managed, but it's not necessarily something that can always be cured. And so it's important that from the front end, from a young age, that youth have access to quality sexual education, as well as health care. Also access and ability to obtain quality education, um, caregiver classes and support, and access to child um, quality child care. Something that we frequently see with youth that have experienced commercial sexual exploitation is that there's oftentimes a supervision component to it. And when you look at many of these these situations, there, and we talk to the Division of Family and Children Services, or we talk to the Department of Juvenile Justice, we find that the parent's ability to provide supervision to that kid has been a concern for years. And part of that is because the parent has to work in order to be able to meet that child's basic needs, but they don't have access to um, quality child care. And so um, all of these efforts that you see on the left side of the screen are things that we can start advocating for as individuals. Um, and these things alone can help um, ensure that later on that, you know, five, 10, 15 years from now, 
that CSEC is not such um, an epidemic issue that it is right now, not only in the state of Georgia, but across the nation. So let's talk about some online signs to watch for. Um, so Ms. as we hide- Ms. Cleveland oh, Kennedy, sorry for interrupting. <laughs> so we just have about three more minutes left. I'm so sorry that I have to interrupt you, sorry. Yeah, absolutely, no problem. We have just one or two more slides, so I'll be sure to, to make it quick. So um, with the online signs, we talked earlier about how technology plays such a pivotal role in exploitation. Um, and so if you're working with a youth where you have CSEC concerns, um, if you see some of these, uh, you know, some of these behaviors, that's certainly something that, you know, may prompt um, the need for more intervention or for some questions to be asked. So youth that are hiding their screen, becoming sensitive about who they're talking to, vague details about new friends or taking private phone calls um, and not talking about what they're doing while online can all be risk factors. This next slide just talks about some other steps that each of us can take as individuals um, to try to take action and to help further prevention efforts in this area. So learn exactly what you guys are doing today. Learning more about this topic, learning about the risk factors um, absolutely can make a difference. And then not only that, taking what you've learned and sharing it with others, sharing it with family, sharing it with friends, sharing it at other events that you may go to. Talking with youth, um, we talked about some of the upstream initiatives, but making sure youth know about body safety, sex, sexual abuse, knowing what healthy and unhealthy relationships look like, and recognizing that while social media and online, you know, having access to phones and computers is great, recognizing that there's also a dangerous side to it, and they need to be um, aware of individuals that may be approaching them, um, looking to coerce them or force them into situations um, that they did not intend to get into. And then also just volunteering, supporting local trafficking efforts um, or local organizations in your community, such as CASA, um, your Boys and Girls Club, um, other local nonprofits. And so with that, I know we only have a couple of minutes. And so we wanted to um, offer time if anybody had any quick questions that they wanted to ask before we conclude today. Okay, thank you so much, Ms. Cleveland Kennedy, for that awesome presentation, I must say, well detailed. And also, Ms. Uh, Naisha McDowell, we do appreciate your time and we value the well detailed and very enlightening presentation you gave us. Um, so we're throwing it out here to everyone who may have questions for them, please. And I just want to add, we appreciate you having us today. And on this slide, our contact information um, is there. So if anybody has any questions later on, um, we're happy to answer any questions um, even after this presentation. Questions? That was a lot of content to throw at y'all. <laughs> but we have, I must say they were very well, it was very enlightening, very, very enlightening. Um, do we have any questions? I will presume. And this is my shameless plug. We need more public health professionals in this work. So if you're interested, um, we're happy to talk to you about it, but there's always a need for folks that have a macro level of, of this issue in particular that can join this fight. So just think a uh, shameless plug there. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. McDonald. So, um, okay, so I guess I'll wrap up at this point. Once again, we want to say a very, very big thank you to you both for coming to um, OSTAR Ground Round session today and present to us today. We do appreciate and value your time. Um, I would like to remind everyone that we have another session next week, um, Wednesday, um, same time at 12 noon. And we do thank everyone for coming in here today. So do have a nice day, everyone. Oh, so, so, I'm so sorry. One, I think someone asked a question here. Do you have volunteer opportunities for students? Yeah, absolutely. So, so right now we don't, we do have internship opportunities that we have where we work with different universities for internships. Um, we currently for the CSEC response team, just due to the sensitivity of the, the data and the information that we have, we don't have any um, peer volunteer, um, volunteer opportunities. I know we have, we partner with child advocacy centers throughout the state and oftentimes um, local child advocacy centers may 
um, have different volunteer opportunities. I know in Bullitt County, the uh, CAC there is the Teal House. I know that Coastal CAC is also the CAC in Savannah, so they may also have volunteer opportunities, but we certainly do have internship opportunities um, available um, for students that are interested. Okay, thank you. Thank you for telling us that. I think that question came from Ms. Kathleen. Okay. All right, then I guess we'll wrap up for today. Thank you so much. Do enjoy the rest of your day, everyone. Bye-bye.